All right, we can go to other speakers and other moderators uh, of our discussion. Good day, my name is Peter Svermaev. I'm an activist of uh, American and Ukrainian descent. I'm very glad to be here with you. And before we start, I want to thank you, everybody, and thank you, Leah. And I would suggest to honor the defenders of our country with the minute of silence of those who died defending Ukraine. Thank you. So, to start, several words on this uh, subject. I have a personal story how in uh, 1994 I left my Donetsk to study in the United States and I came to Atlanta, Georgia. I was looking for a stamp to send a postcard back. And I uh, came to a place where they do sell stamps and I asked, uh, can I buy stamps to mail something to Ukraine? And she was not aware where Ukraine is, what Ukraine is. It's been three years at that time since Ukraine became an independent state. And a uh, person in the United States selling stamps was not aware of Ukraine. People in the world perhaps knew Sergei Bubka from Donetsk and uh, perhaps uh, a soccer player, Shevchenko, and then later maybe a boxer, Vitaly Klitschko. And uh, as, of, as we stand today, nobody has any doubts about where Ukraine is. The future of the 21st century is uh, already being formed today in Ukraine. General Secretary of NATO already said that uh, yeah, said that um, about the future. And uh, Minister of Defense of the United States is of the same opinion. We have a very important discussion here today. We'll go in the alphabetical order. Alexei Arestovich uh, will be first. He is an advisor to the office of the President of Ukraine, as it was mentioned. And um, Mr. Alexei, please go ahead. I, uh, hello, everybody. Sincere greetings to all attendants. I understand the translation will be automatic, right? The translation is being taken care of, yeah. right? Yeah. Right. Yes? Yes. Is it being simultaneously translated? I just assume that I say yes. Alona, anyone? Alona, is this being translated? All right, good, yeah. So, in 2014, I said the phrase that Ukraine fell asleep in Europe and woke up in Israel. And today, our President Zelensky is talking about the same. He is saying that Ukraine will either become a great Israel or will have huge problems. We'll understand that Russia will not give up, and it's only about the form that it'll take, because uh, Russia will be looking for revenge, because uh, Russian government under Putin, or without Putin, uh, Putin after defeat, uh, will fall into resentment. Whatever we know about Russia, it behaves itself the way to demand an next round if they lose on this one. So there'll be a second attempt. Either to capture Ukraine as a whole country or parts of it. And I think Ukraine and Israel are the only two countries in the world that are in this uh, situation 
where they face other big countries who announced that one of their goals, uh, the destruction of uh, these two. I may be wrong, but I think uh, these are the only two countries. I don't think there is a third one that is in the exact same position. Um, so Ukraine and Israel is a good platform to look for understanding, saying what happens if there is a second round? We need to be ready for it. Because the main function of the army is not even waging war, but preventing war. And the basis for any economy and culture and any other advancement is uh, based on security in this case. Israel knows that uh, much better than many others. And uh, we are learning that because we are facing the next biggest war after the, by the scale after the Second World War with the enemy who wants to destroy us. Because what uh, Russian soldiers are saying when they shoot in the back of our soldiers, uh, when they execute our civilians in Kherson and other regions in Zaporozhye, they say there are no Ukrainians, there is no language, there is no culture, there is no such country. And, of course, uh, with this approach, we did, were not left with much uh, variance for the compromise. However, the best thing we can do is uh, to prepare in the next uh, several decades that I hope we'll have to prepare for security, for military security, to have uh, military security and uh, diplomatic and information security. Israel has a unique unique experience, a complex uh, existence with a constant threat when somebody wants to destroy you today. Israel uh, has a very easy pathway to understand what uh, Ukrainians are going through because right now we're going through the war for independence and uh, Judgment Day war together. And this is also very easy for Ukrainians to understand because we know how it is to be bombed and how it is to be hiding in the shelters. And uh, just today, uh, this morning, Kiev was attacked with Iranian drones. The biggest uh, advantage we can find in this situation is to find what technologies can be exchanged, what technologies can be invented, uh, both uh, military but also high technology and uh, other construction, constructive experiences. This is probably the best experience we can have in Ukraine. And as I told Peter when he was inviting me to this summit, um, Let's say the after-war reconstruction will probably be a bigger task than the war itself. It's said that uh, Ukraine doesn't have much experience in doing that because for 31 years before these events we were in some way asleep. We had an illusion that nobody is going to attack us, it will be peace and everything will be all right. But it did not happen this way. And we need to get used to, and not just get used to, but also quickly, rapidly rebuild the whole system with a big capital letter S. Uh, the whole government system, not because it was bad, but because it was developed to answer different tasks. And right now we have other tasks and other important pressing matters that need to be addressed. And this is a huge work for civilization work for our people. The scale of it is humongous. This is uh, work that needs to be done by every citizen of the country as much as they can. Uh, to change and affect the whole government mechanism and mechanism of uh, non-government organizations and uh, every other system. Israel went through the war for independence. You had your own difficult discussions in the end of 40s, early 50s about uh, certain structures of the government, how it will be working and so on. And you have about 70 years and six huge wars in your experience and a lot of terrorist threats in these uh, times. The main experience that we can use as a basis is to use that huge chance, historic chance, that uh, falls for after the war reconstruction. We'll have several years when the world will still be interested in Ukraine, when a lot of attention will still be focused here, and we must not let this chance go. And we must work on restructuring 
a very total restructuring of our country. And we need to sustain the balance, similar to how Israel keeps their balance between the society and military and people who are ready and uh, ready to answer a security threat, but also to stay and keep an open, dem uh, open democracy. And it's a joint effort of society and te technology. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Alexei. We would like to give other chances uh, to present their material, and then perhaps everybody can ask uh, questions at the end. So the next speaker will be Yuli Heretz. He is a representative of uh, Ukrainian Communications Service and uh, Communication Security Information uh, Security Information Defense Service in Ukraine. We'll, he'll talk about the way Ukraine can preserve their uh, level of communications uh, despite the situation that when they lost hundreds of communication towers and got uh, hundreds of miles of uh, fiber optic cables destroyed and they needed to rebuild and this capacity and uh, somehow resist and do that while defending from Russia, which is considered to be at that time a second army in the world. All right, uh, tell us more about your organization. So today I represent Federal Service on the question of information defense and special communications, and I want to remind that uh, these days Ukraine is resisting an absolute evil, uh, an aggressor, which uh, is, uh, invaded our country and is destroying our civilian infrastructure and uh, killing our citizens. We mostly are doing, doing that for nine months because the courage and uh, amazing feats of our Ukrainian military. And uh, of course, one of the functions of uh, government is uh, to provide for security of information. And uh, information, unfortunately, is one of the key elements of any of the war uh, waged these days. Our service is carrying out about 90 functions. Uh, but let's focus on the main. It's uh, cyber defense of uh, government information resources. Um, hacker attacks. Um, became one of the main directions of war, main fronts of war against Ukraine. And uh, they are very often represent hybrid operations and also complement the actions of Russian military in Ukraine. Federal uh, organizations of energy and other systems in Ukraine have experienced uh, thousands of different attacks. And uh, our service is providing functioning of these systems, so we're providing the continuous uh, ability to communicate and to carry out their tasks. And we manage the electronic communications uh, in Ukraine and uh, main nodes, main hubs of those. Our country is effectively uh, maintaining uh, access to internet and uh, access to reliable communication. This is important because uh, we need to coordinate a lot of different services throughout the country. We also use a concern BRT that helps to provide uh, TV and radio signal to the occupied territories of Ukraine. Uh, however, we do need to restore a lot of that uh, infrastructure because Russia, with their missile strikes on TV and radio towers, uh, started that information part of this war, and uh, they basically tried to cut Ukraine citizens from any access uh, to the information about true situation, true state of things and flow of this war. Uh, we have very serious, serious tasks uh, in front of our service. We need to restore internet uh, to deoccupied territories. 
because uh, otherwise they, they do not have anything. TV translation was destroyed, uh, they don't have any infrastructure, they don't have any way to obtain information, and this is one of our main tasks, to restore TV, radio, internet signals. And Russian troops are, have destroyed so much that uh, we can gauge it at uh, about four billion dollars um, of destroyed infrastructure. New challenges for our federal service for the information security was uh, also to resist to provide a whole front of resistance for the cyber attacks of the enemy. And we understand that uh, our first task is to protect our own networks, but we also need to preclude further attacks from the uh, foe. And Israel actually has some good experience in active resisting to the enemy and uh, in looking at new approaches in cyberspace, new effective systems and new effective ways to prevent such attacks. And uh, we essentially facing a similar situation where we need to neutralize attempts of Russians to destroy our information structure and uh, try to preclude their hacker attacks and to learn how to effectively resist um, these attacks. The information structure is, uh, of course, uh, in need of financial help to rebuild everything, but also we are learning and we need additional um, technology and knowledge to fight more, to implement new standards and new systems for defense of our infrastructure. We are resisting the enemy that is significantly stronger than we are in military power, and uh, to be able to withstand that, we need to we need the help of the whole world. Julie, thank you so much. All right, um, thank you, thank you all. If you read the newspapers um, before the war, at the beginning of war, uh, there was an article in New York Times that despite the fact that Russia started attacking Ukraine, um, our systems were not fully destroyed, aviation industry was not fully destroyed, aviation uh, air defense was not fully destroyed, despite of intentions of Russia. It was heroic uh, efforts, and one of the main reasons why Russians failed to achieve their goals was the uh, Department of Defense of Ukraine. This is uh, one of the main departments that is providing for us to exist and to continue resisting. Well, I'm honored to present uh, Evgen Shrestuk, uh, Colonel of Ukrainian military, and he is our next presenter. Good day. Um, I am here representing our department, um, the Situational Center of Minister of Defense, with uh, modern achievements and technological progress, uh, we have a whole new set of methods and tools to wage warfare, including processing big uh, data sets, and uh, it's not just social, political and economic, but also um, military data sets, uh, which also increases our defense capability. Um, very often, these data sets require huge uh, cap uh, processing capabilities in order to uh, get the right conclusions and in order to analyze it in the right way. Situational Central Ministry of Defense is carrying out the task of uh, situational analysis uh, and providing objective information and uh, prognosis for uh, crisis situations unfolding and uh, new crisis uh, centers emerging. 
The problems that we encountered during this war is, uh, of course, uh, standing partly in resources, because uh, you do need hardware, and then you also need uh, human resources to be able to run these systems. Um, people who know, who have know-how and knowledge how to work that. And we have to express a huge gratitude to our partners and to our volunteers who gave us access to a ton of uh, new software um, until the end of, with free right to use until the end of war. But even in these conditions, we also continue to enhance and to develop new tools that uh, help us in analyzing for example, systems uh, that monitor media, monitor social networks to be able to, do, to filter it by the entities transmitting so that do, does help us to figure out what's happening where and especially uh, in certain parts of uh, the front. Um, here's a system, for example, we have for gauging uh, different kinds of information uh, in the media sphere. We developed additional system to, that helps us to work through the budget uh, situation with different branches of Ministry of Defense. Um, of course, uh, a situational map of potential crisis situations, for example, radioactive uh, threats, seismic threats, uh, fires, and other uh, things that uh, can affect critical infrastructure. For example, this is the analysis of the budgetary program of uh, Ministry of Defense with some prognosis included. And I wanted to stop here also, pay some attention to the cyber part uh, of uh, this reality. Yuli Palich already spoke a bit about that, but uh, I can say that uh, with some pride that we are the first in Ukraine and probably um, the ones who got a system to analyze uh, cyber traffic, uh, to analyze uh, cyber incidents. For example, let's stop on this slide. I would like you to take a look at this one and understand that enemy, despite their attempts to hide their activity, they cannot hide from our cyber specialists. So we see which uh, hacker groups are doing and targeting which uh, areas, what are they hiding and what are they attacking. That information we transmit to the security service and to the military and other special services of Ukraine to take measures. By decision of the Minister of Defense, um, our department was used for deployment of the Operational Center of Cybersecurity, MILSOK, and uh, there was a special group created to react uh, to cyber incidents, um, the ones that work with uh, our partners, our internal uh, subjects, to help us prevail in this war. Thank you. Thank you very much, Evgeny. So uh, let's open the floor for questions. Perhaps start with you, Ambassador. Let's do it very quickly, so maybe we can also have a chance the audience to ask questions. Of course, uh, there are always uh, complaints that uh, not enough is done, but uh, Israel has done a lot. Israel has done a lot to help Ukraine already and uh, Ukraine is lucky to have a partner such as Israel and in situation of constant military threat could you tell us more about uh, this topic how our cooperation can develop and can evolve to the next level uh, resisting Russia and Iran, similar threats that we're facing. Thank you. Thank you again for your words, uh, Yuri. And Alex, thank you for your wise words. Um, 
Of course, I agree with things uh, have been men that were mentioned, and I can uh, subscribe under most of your words uh, fully. And Israel is uh, a sample, as an example for Ukraine of how to resist global issues of uh, security since uh, 40 year uh, since the year of 1948 our country keeps uh, facing terror and destruction threats and that's why our position is very special and very precious for Ukraine to use uh, our uh, our experience and perhaps try to implement that in Ukraine and adapt it for Ukraine. Unfortunately, you cannot uh, just copy-paste Israel experience in Ukraine. Um, that is not even expected of anybody, but uh, we need to find uh, probably an option to help you take the better practices and implement them based on the concrete situation and concrete challenges. I'm uh, very glad that we're here with business uh, representatives, with companies that are involved in uh, Ukraine-Israel relations, um, because they are helping us to transfer that technology and uh, uh, that experience uh, and that experience has already been uh, used and fully implemented. Uh, it's uh, undergoing as we speak. Um, of course, uh, there are different sides of it. There is medical assistance with PTSD, uh, there is uh, assistance to helping uh, where women's organizations are helping Ukrainian women who are facing certain psychological risks uh, based on the current situation. And also, as Alex mentioned, reconstruction of Ukraine is a huge project that will continue with uh, uh, American and uh, European and uh, I be believe Israel should be also playing a big role in this rebuilding process. Uh, a, a somewhat a central role and I believe that Israel will be playing um, a serious role in this process. Um, what also is important is to maintain our good, uh, friendly relations between our countries for our joint future cooperation and future friendship that I hope will be developing. Okay, dear Ambassador, um, we do have... Uh, a question. So, Ukraine is uh, closely facing the same situations as uh, Israel does, so facing the situation of destruction. But unfortunately, Ukraine keeps voting weirdly in uh, United Nations, uh, voting uh, rather consistently against Israel on certain resolutions. Uh, in recent times, they voted three times uh, against the interests of Israel in the United Nations. And about the question about the International Criminal Court, uh, where there was appeals to introduce Israel, to bring Israel to that and uh, conduct some negotiations, force Israel to negotiate with Palestinians' attention in Moscow. So, Alexei, can you perhaps uh, elaborate on what's happening here? Well, um, since Ukraine became an independent country, independent state in 91, it uh, tried to keep the system of international law um, on the same markers that they that we inherited from Soviet Union. So changing system is a lengthy and a subtle process. Sometimes it takes several years, sometimes it takes longer. And uh, that inertia of uh, Ukraine diplomacy is going on for 31 years. For example, we as a country who are being threatened with uh, nuclear weapons, we probably should be voting against nuclear threats. And uh, similar questions uh, 
you know, that uh, essentially stems from the similar positions of the Soviet Union and the way that uh, Soviet Union uh, positioned itself um, against Israel. And what I see here, I see the inertia of uh, Ukrainian diplomacy, to my regret. Uh, as I say, as, as my personal opinion, to avoid strong words, it is very strange what's happening. And I always uh, speak openly about that, that the situation uh, the, this, like, let's force Israel to negotiate with Palestinians in Moscow. That is uh, beyond uh, the acceptable limits. And unfortunately, I do not uh, set the course of our country. And for me, is looking at this question of this problem that you brought up is, uh, I think it is inertia and probably an oversight because uh, right now Ukraine is too deep and too busy in military, in solving military problems. And the average work day for every uh, diplomat of ours lasts for about 18 or 19 days every day. So I think it's just uh, the overall tiredness and oversight that they keep uh, haven't changed the, the pattern of voting, even under these times, because it's really surprising. It's still surprising for me. And I'll be vocal, I'll say I'm against it. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, I know that in December, what is the date uh, when the criminal court will be uh, convened again, when the voting will happen? I think this is set for uh, to happen at the end of this month. And I also think that uh, I agree with Alexei that it's probably an oversight uh, that is happening with the Ukraine voting. And I want to say here that, uh, once again, uh, that perhaps our president, our president of Ukraine, is the most informed uh, person in the country. And Minister of Foreign Affairs also knows something which I don't know. Perhaps there is an undertone of a certain play with Arab countries or other countries that are not directly related with the conflict. But uh, um, I always thought that uh, in the situations like that, when they're that complex, there's a wonderful button in United Nations that you can vote present. So if it is too difficult to take one side or another, you can just uh, press this button and basically it tells that you forgot to vote or you were present but you did not vote. And I think this could be a very good pathway forward for Ukraine. Uh, that also would be keeping strategic interests of cooperation with Israel. Okay, uh, thank you, Alexei. Great. The next question is about humanitarian aid. Uh, there is a summit ongoing in Paris, and uh, President Macron uh, made statements there. Uh, he was talking about options of uh, additional humanitarian help. And um, Yuri, uh, what else uh, can be addressed? What other areas uh, need additional help? Thank you for the question. Thank you to our partners that continue helping us from the beginning of this war, since the beginning of Russian aggression. and. Uh, help us uh, to fight, we understand it's the ninth month of war, and some countries already start to forget that there is war going on in Ukraine still, uh, but still big thanks to our partners that continue providing aid and uh, fighting with us together. Um, and as you understand, just from my previous statement, there were four billion dollars uh, that were sent towards uh, rebuilding of uh, radio and television and infrastructure, information infrastructure. Um, I understand that, uh, of course, uh, nothing is enough while the conflict is ongoing, and, but we also don't stand uh, on one spot. We are developing and we're finding more effective ways to use uh, and rebuild. And we understand that Israel has uh, probably the most foremost uh, military experience rel rel uh, relatable to what we're going through. 
and uh, perhaps deeper cooperation with Israel in military matters uh, may help us uh, in the nearest future. And uh, I would say we still uh, we're glad to receive any help in that area. So thank you, thank you for the question. Thank you, uh, Yuli and Evgen. What uh, do you think Israel could do? What hasn't been done yet to help you fortify uh, your office and the capacity of your office? Um, I cannot answer, give a single answer to that question because, as I mentioned earlier, we have five different areas that we monitor and analyze politic, economic, social information, and military support. And I think that we, we, we think, our team thinks that information sphere is probably the most important and uh, the most important uh, data sets are coming from there. What we see uh, there, for example, uh, implement the Jurassic of Doctrine and uh, there are certain targets uh, that it helps us to define and also define the main uh, directions of their information attacks and uh, define the target audience that are being uh, targeted. So as for information attacks, uh, what we would want to be working on, uh, probably any technology that helps us to um, strengthen analytical and prognosticating capabilities in this regard. Okay, so I would want to ask one more question before we open the floor. Why Putin's team, uh, security team, failed uh, to completely overwhelm our cyber security at the beginning of war? I'll be real brief. These are the same guys who wanted to take Kiev in three days. And that's all you need to know about them. And I also would want to compliment Evgen um, to say that our special service uh, opened active actions in cyberspace and critical objects of infrastructure that we take care of. And I understand that I cannot say problem, but uh, any misunderstanding between Israel and Ukraine in different directions, understanding the complex situation of Israel that is basically fighting every year against some military threats. And Russia, of course, has a very special influence on both of our countries. We understand that. Uh, so perhaps uh, there is uh, good things to uh, cooperate on developing uh, critical object infrastructure protection, the ones that are not involved with lethal weapons. Uh, but uh, definitely the ones that, uh, if attacked, will be uh, significant, uh, will cause significant problems. So that's where we can cooperate between Israel and Ukraine, I think, uh, a bit stronger. All right, all right. Uh, we have about uh, 20 minutes. Uh, let's talk a little more. We have a few more questions uh, that we can bring up. If you want to ask a question, please uh, raise your hand, uh, take the mic, and... Uh, Introduce yourself. Good day. Um, I'm representing, thank you for the first of all to the presenters. I represent here one of the biggest uh, technological associations of IT companies of Ukraine. And I don't know whom do I address my question, but uh, uh, whoever feels like uh, you can answer to that, I guess. Right now, we present our companies here on the Technological Summit. Um, we present our capabilities to the West and we already facing that partners refuse to work with our companies because of uh, the current military situation and uh, some partners are afraid to give us uh, to involve our companies in their projects uh, for risk of failures of failure to meet deadlines. Uh, at the same time, we see uh, we can still uh, stabilize a lot of works and provide our prove our effectivity. But in order to do that, we need to get at least some cooperation, some work. So my question is, do you think Israel can help us to create that communication and that additional proof uh, 
on the international level that uh, Ukrainian IP address is available. We are working and we can provide work, we can uh, uh, produce. So, and we are very capable. Um, okay, we have, uh, I understand that we have a lot of companies who have thousands of uh, employees in Ukraine actually, who still work with Ukraine. We, as far as I know, Israel works very close with Ukraine and the work has not stopped. Ukraine was always important for us, uh, speaking of outsourcing uh, from Israel. And many IT specialists, uh, they do work for Israel companies. And uh, of course, on this conference, uh, we'll be able to discuss more venues, how we can help Ukrainian companies to re-establish themselves on the current conditions and uh, to also enforce your companies to be stronger against these threats. And this actually is one of the only sectors of Ukraine economy that keeps growing when the others are dwindling, shrinking during the war activities. And uh, I think, I'm sure that uh, Ukrainian companies will take uh, a proper share of Israeli business um, and will continue our cooperation uh, to a degree that uh, I hope it will help your companies in the future, in obtaining future contracts and maintaining your position on the world market. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ambassador. Good day. I have a question to Yevgen, to Mr. Yevgen. Um, so there is a public information, a system for uh, traffic analysis. Uh, it is our own tool, a known, a known tool that we developed. And I think we uh, will be leading in that area. We can actually use uh, that work with Israel as well. And uh, perhaps you can tell us more about the systems that you talked about. Uh, what are they? What do they represent? Um, that system that I touched in my presentation, this is an American partners provided technology. Uh, it is given to us until the end of war. It is unique. It was uh, just published uh, live in September and about some information became available about it. We are just getting uh, our experience of working with it. We we're trying to analyze uh, and correlate events, uh, the, probably the most interesting uh, aspect of it, to correlate cyber activities with the events on the front. For example, the cases when we see that uh, Russians are taking some important information sources and some SCADA systems, and then in three or four days uh, we see their missiles targeting exact same objects. So we are tracking these events, we are tracking what are they doing, and we're trying to pre predict and prevent uh, additional damage. And we're still working, still learning other applications. All right, thank you again. Uh, more questions? Anyone? Questions? Okay, uh, no more questions for this panel. I think we can conclude. Unless any of you want to say the last word here. All right. Um, I can say a couple words here to the end. Modern world um, has a very interesting feature of horizontal cooperation and the strength of it and how much it affects uh, the events and happening and how much relations between countries actually happen between uh, peoples and the forums like that. It's no, no longer prerogative just of the top-level officials. Um, imagine something, a forum like that about even 10 years ago. Today it's possible. Today it's uh, possible for different reasons, including that war also opens a lot of doors uh, on a much shorter shoulder. Um, 
Um, so I would say that it is important for us to continue cooperating on the personal level, people to people. And uh, very big uh, thanks to the Poland, uh, to Poland, to Polish friends and to Israel friends who help us avoiding uh, bureaucratic barriers and uh, in a calm working level you creating a system, a parallel system of communication of uh, ways to resolve problems that unite us. And I uh, suggest we should continue, we should start that process uh, with um, more vigor. All right, uh, thank you everybody, thank you dear presenters for your work and for everybody who joined us in this conference today.